What I'd like to do is uh, uh, introduce the, uh, the panelists we're going to have today. Uh, we've got a great panel of uh, individuals. Uh, and as I introduce them, if you join me in wel welcoming them, that would be great. So first, uh, we have uh, Dan Fulton, who is president and CEO of Warehouser Company. Uh, Dan is the elected chief executive officer and member of the board of directors. Um, he's chair of the policy advisory board of the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard University. He's on the boards of numerous uh, industry associations. Um, he's vice chair of the Washington Roundtable and a member of the Business Roundtable. And he's a member of the board of the United Way of King County. So, Dan, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Rick Kalbaugh is chairman, president, and CEO of Fortegra Financial. He joined Fortegra in 2003 as COO and was named president and CEO in 2007. In June 2010, he was appointed chairman. Uh, he served as the first general counsel of the Walsh Assurance Group uh, and has practiced law with McNeese, Wallace, and Newark. Rick, please join us. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, we have two EO members. Uh, we have Eric Slaba, CEO of Absco Alarms. Um, it sounds like some, some of you know Eric. Um, he's a majority stockholder of Absco Alarms, a, a life safety and security integration company and a startup company, FCP Intel, a software as a service ERP system for specialty contractors. And he's been an EO member since 1997, so it goes way back. Uh, he chaired EO's 20th anniversary event in Las Vegas and he was one of the vice chairs of the Istanbul uh, University. So, Eric, thank you for joining us. And finally, we've got Dan Price. Uh, Dan's an EO member again, founder and CEO of Gravity Payments, the largest payment processor in Washington State. I think started when Dan was probably eight or nine years old. Uh, he's now one of the top 100 card processors in the country. So obviously very successful. He's won many prestigious awards, the 2010 Small Business Administration Entrepreneur of the Year Award, the 2009 Seattle Mayor Small Business Award, and the Puget Sound Business Journal's 40 Under 40 Award. So we'll be um, spending the next four or 40 minutes talking about a range of topics. Gentlemen, if you want to sit down. I guess the, the most important question of the day is actually, has everybody gotten their 1130 clue for the painting from this morning. If, if you haven't, make sure you, uh, you pick, uh, pick that up. Okay, we're actually going to be talking about, um, what I've done is divided this, this talk into three different segments. Uh, the first segment is going to have to do with the economy and jobs. Second segment is going to deal with uh, the environment for startups. And we'll touch on in innovation a little bit, but a very important issue, particularly for people in this room. And then the third segment is going to deal with how larger companies can better leverage the expertise of smaller companies and vice versa, something that is uh, certainly core to uh, what uh, the Big Startup Program is all about. Uh, so let me start with the um, state of the global, of global economy. And as um, uh, Dr. Knight pointed out, um, the uh, New York Stock Exchange uh, your next CEO report of which uh, ORC International partnered to produce. Uh, one of the things that we found in that study is that almost half of public company CEOs, 48%, and four in 10 small business owners, 39%, rated the global economic conditions as poor. R rather high number. Uh, when you look at uh, the uh, issue in, in the U.S., the results really aren't that much different. Uh, and in fact, the real concern is about the economy going forward in 2013, where people are not showing a lot of optimism going into 2013. So what I'd like to do is sort of start with a conversation. You know, we've all heard lots of reports in the media, lots of newscasts about things. Uh, but what's your own take of what's going on both in the global economy as well as the U.S. economy at at the moment. Any of you gentlemen can start. I'll start. Go ahead. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about global, uh, but focus more of my comments perhaps on, on U.S. Uh, about a third of our company's sales come from exports. Uh, 
and, and that's about an equal mix between uh, Asia and, and Europe, uh, perhaps a little bit heavier uh, orientation to Asia. And, and so our, our major Asian markets are Japan, uh, China, Korea, and then uh, a group of smaller countries. Japan happens to be our largest single export market, about 10% of our sales volume uh, in three of our major product lines. And, you know, Japan economy is uh, actually relatively stable. You know, they've come through the uh, devastation of the tsunami last year. You know, they have uh, infrastructure spending uh, that's occurring, you know, that the uh, tsunami was a major hit to the economy, but, but in fact they are responding and rebuilding. And, and so our activity with Japan is, is relatively steady. Uh, you know, China is a market for us that's fairly significant. You know, they uh, seem to be having a slower growth rate but still growing, and so we're adjusting to that. Uh, European zone is clearly a different issue. So uh, European zone is a market for us. Uh, the value of the euro is important for foreign exchange for s certain of our products, and, and there continues to be a lot of uncertainty about Europe. So. So that's a caution. You know, the U.S. economy, um, somewhat interesting for us. So we, we are heavily dependent upon the U.S. housing market. We've got three of our four major businesses that rely on U.S. housing. Our Timberlands business, Wood Products business, and we're a home builder. Normally, uh, housing would lead uh, an economy out of a recession. In this case, it hasn't. Uh, the broader economy has been better. Uh, Housing is now starting to recover, and, and the broader U.S. economy is faltering a bit. So I would say mixed messages for the U.S. economy. Is your sense, though, as you uh, do work around the world and also in the U.S., um, what, are, what are business leaders thinking? Are, are they thinking that, you know, this is just the way it's going to be for a while? Are they thinking that, uh, you know, we are actually going to start planning for growth and, and, and planning for, uh, you know, business growth uh, in 2013 and beyond? What's the sense you... Well, I mean, I, I've read the, the, the uh, survey results from the mm -hmm. stock exchange uh, survey, and, you know, from our perspective, we're, we're expecting to grow, you know, in 2013, and we're expecting, you know, growth uh, that, that is heavily reliant on recovery of U.S. housing, uh, but broad-based, you know, economic uh, improvement, uh, I would say with the big caution being Europe, mm -hmm. uh, China is a little bit slower, but China is a major factor long term, and and uh, you know we're all tied pretty closely to the right. Chinese economy. Right, right. Yeah. Rick, how about your point of view? Sure. What's your uh, setting aside the Pacific Rim and Europe for a moment? I'd like to focus just on the U.S. Uh, our company spends a lot of time uh, serving a constituent base that has household incomes less than a hundred thousand dollars. Um, I can tell you, generally speaking, uh, we see credit continuing to be tight, um, and I think it will continue to be tight until the securitization markets become more robust. Mm -hmm. um, so insofar as there's not necessarily available credit for that segment, um, it, the growth in the economy is going to be driven by median household income recovery. Uh, and we have two factors. One is, in the last couple of years, uh, median household income has dropped, depending on who you believe, which pundit, which politician, let's just call it $4,000. Uh, but what complicates that is uh, gas prices. At $2,500 an auto, more than it was a couple of years ago, you're talking about uh, taking 6500 maybe as much as 10000 out of the mm -hmm. median household income. So for our constituent, we see some pretty tough uh, times ahead. Um, mm. Are we planning for growth? Absolutely. Um, that being said, I do think there are signs uh, of uh, greater availability of commercial credit. Uh, I know for us, uh, we just redid credit facilities, uh, and we had a, a fairly easy time. Now, I'm not sure our CFO would agree with me, <laughs> but we had a fairly <laughs> easy time placing the debt. Um, so I, I do think there are signs that credit is available. I'm just not sure it's filtering down to the consumer. 
And until it filters down to the consumer, um, I don't necessarily have a, a bullish feel about the U.S. economy. Uh, Great. Yeah. Gentlemen. So, so uh, most of you are probably from the Western United States, and my business is very heavily tied to consumer spending in the Western United States. So we, when you use your credit card, we're the ones that take the money from your bank and give it to that business and to provide all the security and the point of sale connectivity to do that. And so we have a pretty good look at consumer spending and the economy. And for those of you that are from Seattle in particular, I don't know how many of you have experienced this, but I have experienced uh, throughout the last few years going to a popular restaurant on a Tuesday night and being told that I have to wait for an hour for a seat. And so we hear about all these economic problems and we can see it statistically speaking, but I think part of what's happening is there's an increasing, from my perspective, there's an increasing inequality where people that have a, a high pedigree on education, people that have special skills, people that are entrepreneurial are doing better and better and there's a certain segment of the population that seems to not be keeping up and maybe even moving backwards. And so from my perspective, it's a dangerous trend. Um, you know, I think my business and a lot of the businesses that you all have can probably continue to do well for a long time in that economy because we can look for different opportunities. But just looking a little bit more long term, you know, how long is that sustainable, A, B, what are the ramifications for things like security, something that my business does a lot of? You know, how is, how is something like data theft, the environment gonna change with growing inequality? Uh, in Eastern Europe, for example, you have entire uh, uh, teams of, of hackers that basically their entire job is to try to steal all of your guys' data. And with growing inequality in the United States and globally, in, in some areas, you know, is that gonna start to translate to all of your businesses and my business? And so it, I, I feel like it's, we're almost in two different worlds, you know, when I'm on, mm -hmm. at that restaurant on a Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. um, but I can, I can also tell you that um, overall, when you wrap it all up, the small business consumer economy has been growing very modestly this year and the last few years. And, you know, so I, I think it's kind of a mixed bag. <laughs> And you all being entrepreneurs will figure out a way, whether it's a good economy or a bad economy, hopefully to grow your business in that. Yeah, I, th I think the nice thing uh, about being a predominantly Washington State business is I have to worry about Washington State and not the entire global economy. Um, but I also understand that uh, Europe uh, and the, the debt crisis impact the extent that many of our clients will expand or not expand. Um, that being said, uh, we are going to grow about 60% this year, and all of our people's income are up, and we expect about the same growth next year. So at a, at a micro level, um, you know, we're in the specialty contracting industry, so right after 2008, we took a major hit. Our, our whole industry was de devastated. It's predominantly construction. Uh, what we've seen is a lot of the competitors have weeded themselves out over the last three years. Mm -hmm. Several of our competitors are gone. And I think that's leading to a much improved balance sheet this year and allowing us to really take a look at some serious growth over the next couple of years. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, let me add to that, Jeff, sure. just to give a couple more data points as well and, and uh, want to underline what Eric's saying. My business, we're up 40% year over year, and our average office employee has gotten a 15% raise this year. So, you know, we're trying to, I'm not necessarily in favor of like, I don't know exactly the solution to these problems. But one solution is people like Eric and people like me growing, doing our best, and then trying to share that with mm. the people around us. Well, that, that's a great segue to what I want to talk about next, and that is, uh, you know, the, the big issue is jobs. Jobs is the num number one issue in the election coming up. Uh, it's, it's the number one issue about getting, getting the economy going. And I think, what, you know, whether it's from your own experience, what the two of you have done with your, with your own businesses to gr grow them so well, or whether it's running an inter international company, you know, what are the things that have to change? to really get that job growth spark going? Yeah, I, I, I'll take a crack at this one. <laughs> I don't know about my colleagues up here, but I can tell you one of the things that I find is with the prevalence of automation 
and the use of automation to drive productivity gains, which we have to as a public company, um, because we just don't have the luxury of pricing elasticity that many of you enjoy. Um, uh, it is very hard to find the hyper-specialization of the employee base. And it's hard to recruit them, and it's also hard for me as a leader to connect with them. I come from a very different environment. You heard my background. I went to law school. What the hell do I know about you know, some of the stuff they're talking about? Um, so it is really hard, in my estimation, to predict the meaningful growth environment mm -hmm. for companies, unless, from in a jobs market, unless we as a, a country can address the needs of those companies going forward, not taking liberal arts degrees, but people who have that specialized IT skill or very special skills, uh, apprenticeships are gonna have to come back at some point. They were a thing of the past when we had uh, craftsmen, and I think it's a, a wave in the future where they get, mm -hmm. where they have unique interests, unique skill sets, and they can test them within a company <coughs> and then grow within that company. So for you, it's a question of ed education and job training. Oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's that we don't want to hire people. Our biggest challenge is finding people who can take us beyond where we are today, two steps ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those technical skills are very difficult to find. Source mm -hmm. and keep. The keep part is the really hard part. Dan, go ahead. So I, I have a, some similar reaction, but, but perhaps a somewhat different slant. We've, we've been through a period over the last five years in this recession that has really been uh, devastating you know, for our industry uh, as we have retrenched and, and cut back. And you know, there's been a lot of talk about you know, what is American industry doing to create jobs. And uh, you know, we're, we'll create jobs when we have customers. So we've gone through significant retrenchment, but now we are actually coming out of this recession and we are hiring. Uh, you know, we are also experiencing an aging workforce. And so this isn't so much a comment for the entrepreneurs in the room, but you know, we're hiring and, and we are going to have problems finding skilled mm -hmm. workers. Uh, you know, technical jobs in all of our operating facilities, whether they're focused on repair and maintenance, process control, which are highly technical jobs. You know, our challenge is finding qualified personnel today. And, and there will be more, whether it's apprenticeships and, you know, redevelopment of programs and pipelines of, of uh, young people coming out of, you know, not just universities, but technical schools, junior colleges. Uh, you know, I think industry is going to have to be engaged in that process because our educational system, you know, is not doing the job mm -hmm. today. So. You know, I, I actually think that in the recovery, um, you know, the, the, the restraint will be qualified employees. Hmm. And so we all have, you know, a significant stake in that. And, and, it's, and it's, you know, in large part driven by demographics. So we have, you know, an older workforce, you know, in this country, you know, not as old as Japan, but still an aging workforce with a lot of people that are starting to retire. Uh, businesses have not been bringing in younger people during the recession, you know, to train and to back up and to understudy those positions. And so there's going to be a bit of a gap and, and, and I think also great opportunity for, you know, new hires in, in, in all of these industries. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that's, that's an opportunity, but it's going to be a challenge for us. So well, let me turn it over here. So you, you guys have been growing quite, quite a bit. Um, uh, and again, if we were to find you know, that secret sauce that's really enabled you to, uh, to, to really grow jobs and then expand that to what has to happen within the country to really make that happen on a broader basis. What are the, what are the cues that you have? So I think one of the things that I've got a software as a service startup, and I say startup, it's a four-year-old startup. Uh, mm -hmm. We got our private placement memorandums back on October 28th of 2008 which I'm pretty sure was the same day Citibank announced they were on the verge of collapse. Great time to have a million dollar investment ready to go to raise some capital. Um, and at the time, uh, I, I, was, I was really distraught that this was happening to us. Now I'm grateful that we hadn't raised capital three, four months earlier 
because it would have been pointless. Uh, immediately following 2008, I think everybody was retrenching their existing investments. And so investments as a whole, either at an angel round or um, an investment bank round, really started to focus on how do we save what we have, not how do we create something new. And I think that, that piece of it is just now starting to happen again. We're starting to see deal flow start to happen again. And I think that we'll see entrepreneurs uh, start to raise capital to start these new corporations that will employ new people. Um, I do agree that the education system, if we, uh, if we look at the US immediately following World War II, we imported great minds from around the world. And there were apprenticeships, and, uh, and we really grew a great economy. The challenge today, I think, is uh, a lot of would-be entrepreneurs are going back home from whence they came. Uh, we look at Saudi Arabia, they're importing entrepreneurs, uh, and they're importing business leaders, and they're importing B PhDs. We're exporting a fair number of our people uh, overseas. Um, so I think that's, that's a real concern that's gonna hit us. And if we look at a company like Boeing, um, they weren't hiring engineers for quite a while, and now they're about to face a real issue that their, uh, their engineering force is about to age out with a huge hole in leadership. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know exactly how we solve these things, but I think we need to rethink some of our immigration policies. Jeff, we're investing in the future, and, and for us, we're in a people business. And you know, I agree with all the comments about how I actually think that having the, the best team is actually uh, oftentimes the, the, the limiting factor. And so for us, we've doubled uh, the amount of money that we're spending on retraining our people, on education. We're trying to train them in different ways. Um, so we, one of the things we do is uh, we do a Wednesday lunch together every week and br we bring in a, a business expert or a speaker or a customer service expert or for fun, you know, we'll bring in somebody that's an expert at photography because it's fun to learn. And when you create that environment of it's fun to learn, it's fun to discover the world around you, I think at, at the end of the day you're going to have better internal entrepreneurs with that type of an approach. And, uh, and, and I, I, I wish that there was some way, and I know it's very challenging, but I wish there was some way we could bond together as a country and take a similar approach and figure out how do we value education in the proper way. Not just traditional education, but non-traditional education and find a way to grow as people. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can all grow together as people, then the output will take care of itself. Okay, great. Just one, one last question, just to, uh, prior to moving on to the, the next topic. But so a lot of focus on education, a lot of focus on training, a lot of focus on people. What I don't hear, which is what I hear a lot, are things about tax policy or, or incentives for hiring people or things like that. It's just that um, you think that those issues are less important? Is it just that's the political dialogue of the day? Where do those types of things fit into some of the things you've been so, talking about? So Jeff, one of the things is I guarantee you all that I have the worst accountant in the room by far, which means I also have the highest effective tax rate in the room, I think. And my tax bill is really high. Um, but at the end of the day, having a strong economy is really the thing that's going to make us succeed. And I hear politicians all the time saying things like, if the taxes are higher, then you can't have money for raises and for hiring new people. And maybe I'm just dumb, but the way I think about it is, if, the tax, if, my, highest, uh, if my highest marginal tax rate is 35%, and my coworkers' marginal tax rate is 25%, and I give them a raise, I've just saved us as a community 10 cents. And I actually, when I give somebody a raise, I kind of think in my head, like, that only cost me 65 cents on the dollar to do it. So I've, I've never really figured out this concept of, like, higher taxes is going to, like, stifle it, because it doesn't. Well, it, it, but it does affect those of us who compete globally. Yeah. Because our competitors have an advantage tax rate. Um, and that does have a trickle-down effect. Um, corporate tax rate. Yes, corporate yeah. tax rate. Yeah, I'm yeah. not talking about. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm not a firm believer in tax incentives to hire people. Uh, I think my job is largely to be the chief talent acquirer at the company. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, I don't care whether they have the tax incentive or not. I'm looking for the best people I can find that can make things happen for our shareholders today okay. and off into the future. Uh, what I do think will make the difference 
is if you can address the tax liability just generally across the board for companies, people, et cetera, it mm -hmm. does create more money flow. Mm -hmm. uh, and more money flow we, into the economy will, in theory, uh, depending on whether you believe okay. in John F. Kennedy or Reagan, or, yeah, there's so many different theories about this right. stuff. Yeah. Who knows what's right? Right, we're topic for a different conversation. Right, exactly. <laughs> great. I, I will say, though, that I, I heard a great quote, and I, don't, I can't attribute it to anybody, but it, Americans, by and large, want to be a law-abiding society. And the challenge is there are so many regulations and so many tax codes and so many, I mean, the books are so bloody thick yeah. that I don't think any of us can affirm definitively that we're law-abiding. And I think that's the thing that's distracting you and distressing. You ought to have to sign the thing that we have to sign. <laughs> yeah, I'm really grateful for that. But, yeah. You know, I, I think that the greater issue is predictability. And uh, there's a lot of uncertainty right now, whether it's uncertainty about the global economy, uncertainty about uh, tax mm -hmm. issues, uncertainty about regulation. We've got some uncertainty that's going to be resolved in a couple weeks around the national election. Uh, but uncertainty, you know, slows decision making, yeah. and and I, you know, I've never been a you know advocate of of uh, tax credits for hiring people because, you know, if I've got a need for an employee because I've got customers, we're going to hire them, you know, with or without a tax credit, right. and a tax credit's not going to cause us to hire somebody if we don't have a customer for whom we're manufacturing you know, a product. Great point. And so it, it, it really is related to, you know, what we need is a, a resurgence of consumer confidence. Some of that comes from predictability. Some, some of it comes from addressing some of our longer term issues. You know, there are some breaks on, on recovery in the credit markets, especially for smaller uh, companies. You know, I think credit is generally available mm -hmm. at relatively low rates for, you know, large companies. But, you know, we hire a lot of subcontractors in our home building business, in our logging business. Uh, we have subcontractors that do work in all of our mills. And, and there is a shortage of credit, you know, for smaller entrepreneurs. Uh, and, and once again, you know, ramping up as the economy recovers, you know, one of the issues is going to be credit availability through yeah. local community banks for mid-sized okay. borrowers. Okay. That's actually a good segue to the next topic. Um, and what I want to talk about next is, um, very germane to this audience is what's your sense of what the environment for startups and entrepreneurs is today? Is it is it favorable? Is it difficult? What's your I would say it's, sense on that? It's hyper competitive. There's a lot of people out there trying to compete with you. There's a lot of people starting businesses, um, but the the barriers to entry have come down in a lot of ways. You think about Amazon cloud services and other services like that. It's cheaper than ever to start a successful business today, which means that it's more competitive than ever. And I, my belief is being customer centric, operational efficiency is a way to have a competitive edge. And again, that comes back to people. So, so you, you think the environment is actually very good? It's, it's good and it's competitive, I think, yeah. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of people in this room that are running successful businesses. So. Huh. You know, I, I I think that capital formation, which is the fundamental piece of it, is really much more difficult than maybe it was five years ago. A lot of people have lost uh, equity in their homes. They've lost equity in their retirement accounts. So people who might have gone out and borrowed against those things uh, to start mm -hmm. their business really can't. Uh, and I think that in and of itself uh, is causing people to really bootstrap whatever it is they're going to do. And that, uh, they can do it, but I think it slows uh, the development of the organizations. Um, it may be a good thing be, it, just to learn that, that principle, but, uh, but I do think it slows things. Um, and I think the other thing is that, again, I would harken back to regulation. I know the way we formed our company um, 20 plus years ago, I, my business partner, uh, I offered him 10% of the company the day we got to a certain level. And uh, I couldn't do that today uh, just because of the regulations. Um, he couldn't buy off on that. I would get sued if I did that today. So I think some of those things actually forestall uh, uh, entrepreneurial development. Okay. Now, I, I know you mentioned that you work for some smaller contractors, and, and Rick, I'm sure you had a point mm -hmm. of view, but uh, let, let me sort of pose this question, and that is, if you were to think of 
one thing that would really turbocharge the environment for entrepreneurs, something that could be done, something that could be changed, what would that one thing be? Better talent. I, I mean, I think that's the number one thing that we all want, right? It's better talent. So talent? Yeah, uh, look, uh, talent is obviously the key. Um, but I think it comes down to people and, and capital. And you definitely, uh, I would echo the sentiments of the panelists. Is, uh, Private equity, I'll just give you my experience, it was a boom when we uh, recapped with a private equity firm in 2007. It's a lot tougher to pro recap your company today with private equity, much more difficult. Um, the uncertainty around carried interest, um, their expectations for growth and returns, um, it, it, it has been very, very fluid because they really took it on the chin in 08, 09, and they've not been able to dispose of assets uh, in, a, in a solid environment since then. Mm -hmm. So I think there, it, it's, it's a tough environment right now for entrepreneurs uh, who've grown businesses or who are looking to create them because cap the uncertainty around the capital markets, is that's a very difficult uh, area to navigate. When do you think that begins to sort out? Well, I, I think the election will have a lot to do with it. Um, I think there's a lot of concern in the private equity world. We still have a private equity sponsor who's a majority shareholder, so uh, I can only echo their sentiments, which is uh, when, once the carried interest rules are kind of, the whole discussion is completed, they'll have a little clearer picture of what they need to do mm -hmm. as enterprises. Uh, they're not having any trouble raising capital. They raise capital very fluidly. Uh, most are overcapitalized now. Most are looking for new transactions. Um, the reason they're not putting capital to work is tax policy, and they don't see clear exit strategy. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, okay. I, I think that uncertainty uh, is important. I, I think the key to success for an entrepreneur is to have a great solution. Or a customer, uh, whether it's you know a direct customer or whether it's uh, you know another company, you know, business mm -hmm. to business solution. I, you know, there has been during this recession, uh, you know, significant cutbacks of employment in you know most major corporations. Uh, those large corporations are going to be very slow to rehire, you know, and very careful about building back their overhead and probably more. Uh, open to outsourcing solutions and you know your reference to cloud solutions boy you know a startup company can be very agile and and can operate with relatively low overhead compared to you know a, a company that has been around a while that has a lot of legacy costs legacy systems even uh, so I, I think it's about coming up with great solutions okay. and great products so that, that sort of bleeds into the next topic um, which is in innovation uh, with it being important for the entrepreneurial environment, we're seeing that the two of you have created some pretty innovative things. The, the question becomes, what is it that um, in your experience you've been able to do within your companies to keep that innovative spirit going? Some people refer to it as entrepreneurship as opposed to entrepreneurship, but clearly a, a, a very important piece to come to uh, growing a company, so I'm, I'm curious. Lessons that you've picked up along the way, things you've seen in other companies, what's your, what's your thoughts on that? I, th I think I'm gonna get boxes of crayons after today. <laughs> uh, so I, I'll say that. Um, you know, I, I, I was just at the 3M Innovation Center uh, last Wednesday, and uh, talk about really making innovation core to a business. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things they, they spoke most about, and I think we've done pretty well with this in our own organization, is ensuring that there's a that there isn't silification of, of information and experience, and really bringing the different working groups who may be hyper focused on their one thing together in a way that they can talk through the bigger picture. Um, and I, I think again, 3M is one of those companies who's clearly done a really good job with that. 
So getting in the, into the weeds a little bit in my business, let me, let me give you a sense for what our customers face. So our customers are businesses that accept electronic payments, typically credit cards, and they do under a couple hundred million dollars a year in credit card processing. It's actually the fourth largest expense on their P&L. But the other three they understand very well. They have a lot of competence around. This one is very opaque. Uh, it's a lot of the money is going different places. They don't really understand it. There's a lot of hidden fees. Just a very opaque, confusing, expensive thing. So for us, our innovation was just trying to fix that. We want to create transparency, let people know what they're paying, why they're paying it. And we actually, on our invoice to our customers, we actually show them what our gross profit is on them as a customer. So they can see everything, they can negotiate. And you know, one of the downsides to that is my margins are a third, my gross margins are a third of what my competitors are. The upside to it is my lifetime value of my customer is double because I keep the customer for 10 times longer. So that, that's basically, to me, that was innovation. It's like, I, I was 19 years old. I said, I just want to kill this industry because it seems horrible. I don't know if I can make any money. Mm -hmm. And then I fell into the innovation, which was actually when you're in a, a recurring revenue business, if you just look at customer acquisition cost and lifetime value of the customer, that's where your profit is. And so if you can find a way to satisfy the customer in a new way to up that lifetime value in a way that doesn't cost them money, I mean, that, that was our example of innovation. So we, we try to keep that fresh by just trying to keep doing it and keep telling that story. From a larger com company perspective, what are things that you do within your organizations to We hold innovate? innovation as a core value of the company. It might be surprising if you think about our business, you know, so our primary business is Timberlands ownership and management and and we've been doing that since 1900. Um, but we have innovated continuously in the process, you know, established the first tree farms, the first uh, seedling nurseries. We continue to, you know, add value in our silvicultural practices <coughs> over time. And, and here we're making an investment in an asset that we're not going to harvest for 30 or 40 years. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's a big bet. Um, at the other extreme, you know, we are c continuing to create new products. We just announced one uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, that we have branded uh, called Thrive, and it's made through our cellulose fibers business as a, a product from our pulp mills. Uh, this is a really early innovation uh, where we're creating a thermoplastic composite that can be used in the formation of parts for automobiles. And, and our first customer is Ford Motor Company, and and they're excited about it because it's a way for them to substitute petroleum-based uh, raw materials with a green, sustainable product coming from uh, sustainably grown cellulose, uh, but has tremendous opportunity because it, it, it both performs better for them, is lighter weight, and it's recyclable. So, you know, we uh, challenge all of our uh, businesses to continue to innovate, and one of the things that we've seen recently is is our customers uh, actually coming to us, even in commodity businesses like lumber, saying, you know, what can you do for us to create a differentiated product, you know, that'll improve my sales. And so it, it does get back to creating solutions for customers okay. and, and a continuous need to help differentiate uh, what you're offering, whether it's credit card processing or, you know, lumber production. It is the innovation is heart and soul of a sustainable organization. Um, it's just that simple. It, it's no longer that you can roll off a bunch of Model Ts and just take them out and sell. Um, it's a global economy, massive competition at all, you know, talking to you folks, you know it, you live it every day. Um, you know, so you have to constantly be introducing new products and services uh, they've done a magnificent job as, as the, the other panelists. Uh, we try and introduce uh, a half a dozen new products a year, from medical mm -hmm. deductibles to we're introducing a new roadside assistance service that's on demand um, so everybody can have OnStar whether you have a GM car or not. Uh, but the technology exists and we're just innovating with that technology to address the needs of the consumer and taking it from a capacity charge to on an as-needed basis. Mm -hmm. uh, 
But if you don't do that, uh, someone else is going to fill that void. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they'll do it very, very quickly because there are a lot of smart people that are hungry for a dollar. Uh, so I, Ooh, I just now don't you start a business is much it. cheaper, right? I, I just don't right. see any way around right. it if okay. you're going to have a sustainable okay. business model. Okay. Let me, uh, for the last few minutes, because I want to make sure that uh, we have some time for some uh, Q&A. Of course, the one rule of moderating a panel is never bleed into lunch. So um, <laughs> I want to make sure that we finish on time here. Um, Two larger companies, two members of EO. Uh, there's a lot of people who say that, you know, uh, and in fact, you know, the whole theory behind the uh, NYSE Big Startup Program is that there's an intersection between large companies and small companies. Large companies providing some mentorship for small companies, and perhaps small companies providing some ideas back to large companies. What I'd like to hear is a little bit of dialogue on that right now in terms of what, what do you think the opportunities are? Um, how can large companies and, and small companies work more effectively together so that everybody wins? Well, I, you know, I will tell you that from our perspective, I, there is, as I said before, with the hyper-specialization, we look to outsource uh, quite a bit of our technology development. Um, we don't go overseas to do it. Uh, you know, we've had people from the EO Atlanta meetings, and I know that they pitched. I don't know whether they won those deals. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I do think companies like ours look to um, the entrepreneurial world to fill voids because we have a snapshot of need to develop a certain system or product or improve a process. Mm -hmm. We're not going to need it for 20 years, or, but we may need it for a year and a half. I'd much rather outsource that to the expertise in the crowd than to build that in-house and then try and retrain them 18 months later. Uh, and I think that is the outgrowth of hyper-specialization, uh, is we as larger companies are going to become more and more dependent upon mm -hmm. the entrepreneurial organizations. That being said, the regulations that public companies must operate under require us to put certain restrictions and demands on outsourcing partners that can be at times burdensome for the smaller companies. Yeah. Uh, mm. If we could do away with that regulatory impediment, I think you'd see a lot more collaboration, mm -hmm. a lot more deals getting done for services and supply. I just heard somebody, one of the two of you, said yeah to that. Who was oh, it? Yeah, yeah, you well, have yeah, to I mean, it. Well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the, some of the regulations, uh, we, we do some government work, and uh, dealing with the FARs is, it, it's just overwhelming. Uh, the volume of time, we, we spend more time dealing with regulation than actually producing the product for the government that they want. Uh, and it's, it's frustrating for our people, and I, I think it's not cost effective for the government. But I, I would also say that uh, yesterday I was with uh, two of my WPO mentors after Rotary, and uh, I was commenting about how their impact on my life has really contributed to this year and next year's growth. Uh, it was uh, because of a strategic decision that was made about two years ago uh, that has led to this, and they were a part of that. And uh, I think just as EO members are trying to foster relationships with uh, the GSEA, I think, it's, I think it's really important that that mentorship and discipleship and apprenticeship that we've talked about as necessary for growing the economy is equally necessary in mentoring the next uh, set of global leaders for business. I think that's something that we've got to get better at as a nation. Let me give you two quick examples of uh, partnering uh, that, are, that are very fresh for me, and, and this relates to our home building business. So we, we're a large home builder, um, but we've got two new innovative, I'll call them products, that we've rolled out in the last year that came from third parties. So these are subcontractors. Uh, one is actually an insurance product. Uh, we call it Smart Move Advantage, and it's a uh, third party provider that uh, we contract with that gets into a relationship with our home buyers, uh, where if a home buyer is wanting to move up or to buy a new home, but perhaps isn't able to sell or doesn't want to sell their existing, what we would call the departure home, 
uh, this third party enters into a relationship, well, they will guarantee a lease back. Now, we pay a fee, uh, but it's something that has actually gotten people into the door to look at a house, uh, to perhaps buy one of our homes while they use this third party provider who will do a lease back for a three year period and, and, uh, and fill a gap. Uh, but, it, but it works more like an insurance product. Another example is a, and we're doing this in our Washington DC based uh, home building company, uh, where you know, one of the functions of a home builder is you have a warranty program with a brand new home buyer that may last a one or two years and, and, and they've just decided to outsource the warranty process, which we've never done internally, but this is somebody that developed an idea, a concept, a company around taking care of this warranty which frees us up. We actually go through a walkthrough, not with the home buyer, but with the warranty company, that then ends up playing this intermediary role, frees our people up to be focused on building homes, finding land, and it's actually a lot better process uh, for our, our home buyer. So two new ideas that came from the outside, you know, not our idea. Somebody came to us, you know, what do you think? And we said, well, yeah, we'll try it. Great, so just that, in, that um, idea and interaction. It's, was, it's was once good. again, creating a solution. Okay. Uh, and, and we weren't looking for that solution, but somebody came into us and said, I've got a solution for a problem that you may have that you don't know about, and, and so we're trying it out. Perfect. Yeah. Dan, I'm just gonna ask you a question, um, sort of a short response, because I, I wanna get to, to answers here, but so you started your business with the intent of killing the larger businesses. <laughs> Um, so, I didn't uh, have anything personal. I guess. No, not anything personal. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't anything. But you know, talk a little bit about what what you could bring to a larger company in terms of um, helping them even be be more effective. Well, I mean, I work in an ecosystem that's really created by a larger a, a lot of larger businesses, Visa and Mastercard. You know, prior to that, all the major banks, um, and you know, the, mm -hmm. the payment system is our whole system is dependent on larger businesses. But there was a subsection of those businesses that had basically taken a very predatory approach to small businesses. In some ways, the whole ecosystem is predatory to small businesses um, because there's a very large uh, cost of interchange. It's almost like a hidden tax every time you accept a credit card. It's a huge amount of money. And you know, the, the, the profit margin on that transaction for the banks and for Visa and MasterCard is, I mean, I would argue around like 95% if you take away things like cost of capital and whatnot. So, which, which is just, they just had tremendous growth. So, basically we saw this and we want to work within the existing ecosystem. We want to play nice with everyone. We want to be friends. But what we really want to do is help the small businesses. And so to the extent that there's larger businesses that are allied with, that, with us around that idea, we really try to partner closely with them. And, uh, you know, competition is always fun. So. Good. Okay, great. Okay, gentlemen, thank you. I think we have some time for a few questions before we break for lunch. So we have time for about two questions, and then we have an important announcement. So, show of hands, or any questions? Question over here. Do we have a way to meet with a couple of individuals? I'm sorry. Do we have a way of individually meeting with a couple of you later on in this event time? I, I know I'm going to be here. All well, the, the two on each side of the moderator coming from the construction industry, and that's what I am. I, I really have questions, and maybe they're pertinent to everybody, but so maybe I'm, I shouldn't hold back, but there's more detail into what I want than probably what can be done and real quickly. <laughs> I have to go back to work after this. Uh, so I'm not going to be sticking around, but I'm happy to have you follow up with me. I can give you a card and you can so contact me, or you can that. ask your question now. Well, the big question, did you guys follow, this is one of the questions, did you guys follow or see the, the first speaker, the economics uh, a speaker that, this morning? Uh, I did not. Roger Ronald? I did not. Uh, well, it had a lot to do with his perception of what's going to happen with capital and China and, and uh, what Ben Bernanke is doing, Bernanke. And I wanted to know if you guys seen that and your feelings versus what he was speaking about because it was really intriguing. And it was to drive home prices, to drive banks to lend home, and actually would probably lower the, the interest rates. Basically, maybe you guys can give your thoughts on QE3. Is, that, was a, that was a big topic. Okay. Well, providing continued liquidity in the market while we recover has been helpful. 
and uh, ultimately the, the Fed needs to get out of that business, but I, I think during this recovery it's been very helpful. Uh, you know, we've, we, we've got really low rates, uh, you know, whether it's business borrowing for larger businesses or uh, mortgage rates, you know, for the uh, industry, but, but ultimately people need to have confidence in the future. So, so, you know, if you have confidence, then you're more likely to buy. Low rates is not going to drive activity unless there's confidence, unless there's a customer out there, you know, that's ready to buy that product. Coming back to my original comment about, you know, tax credits for, you know, uh, new hires, um, you know, low rates help, but uh, confidence of a recovery and, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, looking at those future opportunities and removing some of that uncertainty is more more critical to me. Uh, having not heard his comments, I, that's all I can say. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one last question. If you could stand and give your name too, please, that'd be great. Hi, Mike Ross, EO Seattle. Uh, thanks everybody for coming, really appreciate it. Uh, I had a question, um, it would be great to get everybody's feedback, but uh, with Warehouser and their uh, amazing history, I'm curious as to how you view innovating your business um, in the sense of, you know, like you've gone from only being a, you know, forestry product company to now building houses. So how do you view, you know, healthy innovation and innovating your company versus innovation within your markets that you serve and where's the opportunities? I think we have to do both. Uh, you know, you, you comment, so we started out as a timber company, 1900. Uh, over time, we added manufacturing businesses that were related to the timber business. Uh, we went way beyond that. So we've been a home builder since 1969. Uh, we've been in the marine shipping business. Uh, we have uh, been in consumer products at one time, uh, disposable diapers. You know, over time, the portfolio has changed. Our, our four primary businesses today are timberlands, wood products manufacturing, cellulose fibers manufacturing, and home building. But, but each of those continue to innovate also. You know, so we, we, we need to continue to innovate new products. Uh, you know, we've, we've innovated in terms of our own corporate structure. So we've disposed of some businesses uh, for a variety of reasons. You know, we restructured the company in 2010 to become a, a real estate investment trust. Um, you know, so that was a form of innovation in order to make us more competitive long term. Uh, but we continue to need to focus on, you know, providing solutions for our customers, growing with customers, uh, but doing so in a manner, you know, where we can continue to earn reasonable return on our cost of capital. And, and we've got to be a great competitor in every business that we participate in. So, you know, there, there may be times when we are not the best owner for a business and we've made some of those decisions. And so I think, you know, one needs to continue to evolve and change uh, if, if you're going to survive. Okay, I think that there was an important announcement before we broke. 